is going to get worship in this house. Amen. That's our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Turn to the book of Ezekiel with me this morning, please. Chapter 14. Ezekiel chapter 14 and verse number 12. Ezekiel chapter number 14 and verse 12. Hope you have in your hands the infallible Word of God. Amen. Ezekiel chapter number 14, verse 12. The scripture says, The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, when the land sinneth against me by trespassing grievously, then will I stretch out mine hand upon it, and will break the staff of the bread thereon, thereof, and will send famine upon it, and will cut off man and beast from it. Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. Look at verse 20. Though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter. They shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. Father, bless this holy book now. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. It's a powerful statement, a very powerful statement. If you notice in verse number 20, the Lord swore by himself because he said, as I live. God is swearing by himself because there is none greater. Amen. And this is what he refers to in the book of Hebrews. When there was none greater, he swore by himself. Amen. And the swearing has to do with Noah, Daniel, and Job. The land is under a curse, and it's uh, in its, an imminent judgment. And the Lord God said that even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were here pleading and interceding for you, they would not stop or stay my hand from what I intend to do, they would be spared because of their own righteousness, because they are righteous men. I have named them of all the Old Testament saints. He chose Noah, chose him. He chose him, he chose Daniel, and he chose Job. And he had a reason for choosing them, because he said, by their righteousness, these three men, therefore, by the hand of God are handpicked by the Lord God to be the representation of an Old Testament righteous saint. And all three of these men, therefore, in sight of God, are given as examples, exemplary, of what righteousness is all about. Now, my friend, this doesn't mean that Abraham was not a righteous man. It doesn't mean that, uh, that other, the Samuel, for example, weren't righteous men. But these men are particular in the sense that he called them out and said, I want you to pay a special attention to them. I want you to look at them because they're very important as it relates to the issue of righteousness. All three of these men are historical characters. They have something that happened historically in their lives as it related to the Lord God Jehovah. And therefore, he's going to pick them out to try to teach us a lesson about something that's very important to us. Peter said in 2 Peter chapter number 2 and verse 5 that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. In the book of Matthew chapter number 24 and verse 15, it says that Daniel, referring back to him, was a prophet. Ezekiel 28 and verse 3 talks about the wisdom of Daniel. Then in James chapter number 5 and verse number 11, Job is mentioned in the New Testament, and he's talked about his patience the patience of Job. Patience is a wonderful virtue that is hard to come by. But once it becomes part of your nature and part of your life, it gives you great peace with God because he doesn't have to do it before your very eyes. At that moment, you are able to wait upon the Lord and wait upon God and his timing to accomplish what he intends to do in your lifetime. Wait, he said, upon the Lord. I say again, wait upon God. In the Old Testament it says even one time that trouble or sorrow may endure for the moment, but joy cometh in the morning. Thank God for the morning. Thank God for the rising of the Son of Righteousness. 
with healing in his wings that is able to do for us above and beyond all that we may ask or think. Don't ever make the huge mistake of trying to confine God to your thinking faculties and your mind and think that just because you can think it that God can do it. God can do far beyond what you will ever be able to think. Your mind is nothing in the world more than a creation of the Almighty. And he must expand that mind and renew that mind in the mind of Christ in order for you to begin to think the way God wants you to think. So the apostle here in the book of Ezekiel writes about Noah. He writes about Daniel. And he writes about Job. But he calls your attention to the fact that all three of these men are connected with righteousness. And righteousness is a very wonderful thing. One of the, one of the characteristics of righteousness is the desire to do that which is right. Noah did that which was right in the face of ridicule and unbelief. They mocked him and made fun of him and they had a time making fun of Noah building an ark in the midst of a dry land where it had never rained. But Noah, my friend, was inspired of God, anointed of God, and the Bible says he was a preacher of righteousness. And so no doubt he had warned those people, but they were not ready to listen to the voice of God. Daniel did right in the face of persecution. The Bible said that he prayed three times a day. He would turn his face toward Jerusalem and he'd cry out to the Lord God. When threatened with his life, he continued to pray three times a day and turn his face toward Jerusalem. Why did he face Jerusalem? For Jerusalem was the city of the great king. It was the house of God. It was where God had manifested himself and revealed himself to the children of Israel. Say, so where do you pray, preacher? Anywhere, at any time, anyhow. For every place I set my foot is holy ground because the Lord Jesus Christ is the Lord God of the universe. And I don't need a thing and I don't need a place. All I've got to do is cry out and I know that he can hear my prayer. Hallelujah to God. Then we read of Job. He did right in the face of overwhelming circumstances. Every indication in the life of Job was that God had abandoned him. Nobody, friend, that I've never known anybody in my lifetime that my friend have come as close as Job to the point of complete, utter despair for he lost everything that he had. He was reduced to ashes, sitting with a potsherd, scraping the pus that came out of the wounds in his body. And there, while sitting on the ground, his wife said to him, why don't you just curse God and die? Implying that God has cursed you. He has abandoned you. So you do to God what God has done to you, my dear friend. Job was going to learn through patience. He was about to learn by holding on to God. However small his faith might have been, however slender that connection was between him and the Lord, Job was about to learn a truth that none till his day had ever learned. He was about to learn something about God that he could only learn in a furnace of affliction. And friend, it is what we know about God that gives us our strength and our faith, our understanding and our life in this Lord. God is my life. Christ is my life. Paul said, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. It is what we understand about him, not that we read in books, not that somebody tells us about, not that somebody witnesses, and all these things are good, they're wonderful, to hear the testimony and witness of people that have gone through horrible circumstances and they tell what God's done for them is a good thing. It's a wonderful thing. I would never belittle that. It strengthens the individual. It's a, it's a great blessing to hear that. But folks, you in your own soul and in your own spirit must come to the place where God touches your life in a way that only God can touch your life. And that is between you and Almighty God. He chooses the time, he chooses the place, and he chooses the way that he'll touch your life. And make no mistake about it, if God Almighty has ever touched you, you'll never be the same again. 
This is why the apostle Paul said, I want to know him. I want to know him in the power of his resurrection and in the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his will. The apostle Paul said, I want to know him. He's not talking about knowing him in salvation. He's talking about knowing him in every part that makes up our life as who we are and what we're about. It's God the Almighty that is the source of our life. He's the source of my being. I came forth from him, folks, not from the dirt of this ground. The dirt of this ground formed my body, but God breathed into my nostrils the breath of life, and I became a living soul. Then in 1973, his spirit touched my spirit, and I was literally born of his spirit, and now my spirit, my friend, is the very spirit of the living God energized in my soul. I am a son of God. I'm connected by birth and by blood to the Lord Jesus Christ. He owns me. He tells me who I am. He defines my essence. And one day I'll give him glory to his face. Hallelujah to God for what he's done for me when he raised me from the dunghill and saved me by his grace. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I don't know if you get a hold of that or not. The world is full of people that define themselves and define their identity and draw who they are and the relationship from each other. And the Apostle Paul said, judging by one another or comparing themselves with themselves, they are not wise. Don't ever uh, judge your life and measure your being and what you are by what men say about you. Find it in the closet and in life and in your sickness and in your sorrow, in your pain and your suffering. Find your identity there as God touches your life in every aspect of who and what you are. Is God able to do that? He's able to do above and beyond all you ask or think. Is God ever able to make himself known to you in ways you've never known him? Listen, folks, I don't care if you lived a million years. It wouldn't make any difference to me if you lived 10,000 lifetimes. You will only begin to understand the greatness and the goodness and the blessedness and the sovereignty of Almighty God. He's not a man like me. He's far above and beyond anything that I could ever think that I am. So he did right in the face of overwhelming circumstances. He retained his integrity. Job retained his integrity even though he all thought he was about to lose it. Job retained his integrity even though they tried to take it away from him. Job retained his integrity even though he had no idea what was playing out over the top of his head when Satan appeared before God and brought Job on the carpet and he was going to be the object of his persecution. He had no idea, but he maintained his integrity. Job maintained his integrity without a Bible. He never saw a Bible a day of his life. He maintained his integrity without a priesthood. There were no te temples or tabernacles in his day. Aaron hadn't even been born. Job maintained his integrity in spite of the fact that not a church house was to be found, no preachers around. He and God met face to face. Job maintained his integrity. Integrity. It was his integrity that they tried to destroy. That's what they wanted to tear down. He'd already lost his money. He'd lost his possessions. He'd lost the faith of his wife. He'd lost the dearest and nearest to him. Everything was gone in a whirlwind. All of a sudden, it's all gone, and he's sitting reduced to ashes. What did Job have left? He had God. That's what he had. And God was about to show him something that was going to change him forever. For at the end of the book of Job, you need to remember, don't ever forget this, folks. <laughs> Job started in the book of Job, a pure man, a righteous man, living for God, giving everything he had to the Lord, praying for his family. But he finished the book of Job as an intercessor. Do you know what an intercessor is? Let me explain this to you for just a moment. The life, well-being, future, existence, of someone is dependent upon someone else. When God makes one an intercessor, he puts everything about that other person on the intercessor. This is why you today can be saved, kept, born again by the grace of God because everything you are has been put on the Lord Jesus Christ. He is your intercessor. <laughs> So much for saving yourself and so much for keeping yourself saved. I've got one at the right hand of the Father who keeps me saved and keeps me, period. He's my intercessor. George Mueller was an intercessor in the home in, in, in Bristol, England. 
I drove by and saw the home. It's a beautiful thing. He kept the orphans. They sat down to eat one time, not a bite to eat in the whole house. He bowed his head and said, Lord, I thank thee for the food that you're about to supply for these children. Do you know why? Because George Mueller was an intercessor and God had given the welfare, the life, the future, the hope of all those children into the hands of George Mueller. And when he got through praying the prayer, a knock came at the door and a man said, I got all this food and don't know what to do with it. Have you got anywhere you can put it? And fed it to the orphans. That's the way God works. But that's what an intercessor is. Our Lord Jesus Christ exemplifies all of these men in his obedience, in his prayer life, and in his ministry. The power of the Lord Jesus Christ was to be found when he was alone. His power did not originate from the crowd that surrounded him. His power did not originate from the ministry that he was in. His power did not originate from the temple that he went to, though it was his father's house. His power did not come from his mother, and it did not come from his, from his earthly father. His power came from God Almighty, and that power came when he was alone with God. The Lord Jesus Christ would get alone in a mountaintop, and he would pray all night long. He would seek the face of Almighty God and receive from him what he would minister to the other people. He said, Lord, at the grave of Lazarus, I know that you hear me. I know that you hear me. What a thing to someone to say, Lord, I know that you hear me. That's 99% of the prayer right there. If your God Almighty's heard you, then what he does is just an incidental. Lord, I know that you hear me. But because of these that stand by, I'll pray because of those that are here. They got to see something. Then, my friend, that's where we wind up. We got to see something. But you don't understand that the power of the Lord Jesus Christ came when he got alone with God. I hope you're following what I'm saying to you this morning. He prayed. He prayed. He cried out to Almighty God. He prayed. The basis of his righteousness was prayer. The basis of Noah's righteousness was prayer. The basis, my friend, of Daniel's righteousness was prayer. The basis of Job's righteousness was prayer. All three of these men were well versed and immersed in prayer. I don't know how to pray, preacher. You don't need to know how to pray. You need to know who to pray to. It's not a matter of some formula. It's not a matter of somebody telling you the words to say. It's when you open your heart and you cry out to your maker. You call him the Lord God Almighty. You say, Father, I don't live without you. I can't breathe without you. I can't live without you. I'm nothing without you. Lord God, I need you. And that'll open up a prayer line between you and the Almighty. And so he prayed. It must have been a very difficult thing for our Lord Jesus Christ to go to the cross when he went to the tree and then nailed him on that tree and put those nails in his hands and in his feet. That had to hurt, friends. That had to be a horrible, horrible spectacle. The Bible said that he became a spectacle. The apostle Paul said, we the apostles are made spectacles unto the world. They laugh at us, they mock us. We can all understand that. We can understand that when the Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross, that he hurt, no doubt he hurt. He hurt deeply, but have you thought about how he hurt in his soul? Have you thought about what was going on deep, deep down inside his heart? Have you thought much about what went on in the soul of God? Have you thought much about that relationship that God the Father and God the Son had together when he watched his son carry his cross to the top of Calvary? Have you thought much about the Father as he watched his only begotten son? He said, the one I am well pleased in. He watched him carry that cross to the top of that hill. What went on in the soul of God? There's something going on in the soul of God that it's hard to understand. How, preacher? Because the one that was carrying that cross to the top of that hill had never crossed him one time. Everything God ever told him to do, he did exactly what he said. He was obedient to the Father in every way you can be obedient. And he was dependent upon the Father. The Lord Jesus Christ, every day of his life, every breath he breathed, he depended upon the Father. And so the Father watches him go to the top of the hill. He watches him carry his cross. And he knows where he's headed. He knows what he's going to do to him. He knows that when he gets on top of that hill, and my friend, <laughs> And there he says, Father, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The father knew in his mind and in his soul that he was going to forsake his son. It had to break the father's heart. 
when the Lord Jesus Christ went to that cross and died, they tell us he died from a broken heart. So God the Father's heart was broken and God the Son's heart was broken. All for you and for me. Nobody ever loved you like Jesus. Nobody ever loved you like the Father. Some of you have been looking for love all your life. You've been trying to find love. You put your heart in somebody and they failed you. They stabbed you in the back. They turned on you. You thought they loved you, but there was no love there. A lot of people don't love because they don't know how to love. They don't know what love's about to them. It's just a four-letter word. They don't have a clue what love is until God Almighty touches you, until you get a hold of what I'm talking about today, about somebody that loves you and can Conditionally, a love that reaches down into your soul, a love that speaks to your heart, a love that tells you, I love you, regardless of who you are and what you've done. I love you. Not in empty words. Oh, how cheap words are. My, how cheap words are. But a love that takes hold of you, a love that grabs you, a love that draws you to himself, a love that makes something different in your life. My goodness gracious, how it must have broken the heart of the father when his son went to the tree and he and the father knew that his son loved him and that his son was trusting him and that his son was obedient to him and his son was giving him all that he had and the father knew the time would come when he would make his own son to be sin for us who do no sin. God Almighty knows all things. But I do believe that God alone has the ability to block out certain things. And I have believe that God alone has the ability to experience things experientially, to learn or to experience from that. Not, not, learn's not a good term. Just simply experience what a thing is like. And when his son gave his life on the cross, God felt in his own soul, what was going on in the soul of the Son of God. Turn to Isaiah 53, and you'll begin to understand what I'm talking about. Isaiah chapter number 53, and verse number 10. Now, we all know who Isaiah is talking about in 53rd chapter. We know that. We know the Ethiopian eunuch, when he was returning from Jerusalem, been there to worship. He was out in the desert of Gaza. And Philip was up in the north in Samaria and having a revival meeting. God called Philip to the south, and he went to the chariot where the Ethiopian eunuch was, was, uh, was in. He was headed home. He was, a, he was, a, he was a, a great leader under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians. And the Bible said he was reading from the Isaiah, from the 53rd chapter. And Philip saith unto him, Understandest thou what thou readest? That's a good question. <laughs> You know why? Because the 53rd chapter of Isaiah is one of the most powerful chapters in the whole of the Bible. Do you understand who you're talking about right here in Isaiah 53? I hope we don't have anybody in this house this morning has any doubt in your mind that the 53rd chapter of Isaiah is talking about our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That's who we're talking about. But we're also talking about God the Father. God the Father and God the Son both show up in the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. And there's a take on both of them. There's a way, there's a, there's a perspective on the Father and there's a perspective on the Son. In plain words, the Holy Ghost who wrote the Bible, the Holy Ghost is saying, I want you to see what's going on with the Father, and I want you to see what's going on with the Son. In Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 10, it says, Yet it pleased Jehovah, the Lord, to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. That's a powerful statement. For he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. I want you to think about something. At the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, blood was shed. Revelation chapter number 1 and verse 5 says, Who hath washed us from our sins in his own blood. We Bible believers believe that literally, however God did it, that's God's business. But we believe that his blood washed our sins away. 
And friend, there's nothing else that can wash your sins away. Water can't do the job. Good works won't do it. And church membership won't do it. It takes the blood. Nothing but the blood. When that death angel came through Egypt at midnight, the only thing he was looking for was blood. The only thing he was looking for. He didn't care who was inside. It didn't matter to him if he was an Egyptian or an Israeli, a Hebrew or what. He was looking for blood. And if he saw the blood on the doorpost and littles, he passed over. He hovered over. The word there for Passover literally means he hovered. Like in the book of Genesis chapter number 1 when the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. He hovered upon them. It's when he, the temple, there in the temple when, the, when God's glory left. The Bible said the Spirit of God, the glory of God moved up out of the temple and he moved over to the Mount of Olives and he turned around and he looked back at it with forlorn in his eyes and he hovered. My, what might have gone through the mind of God when the glory of God was leaving the temple and he turned around and looked back at it and he hovered there for a little while. It's contemplation. It's what's going through the mind of God. It's how he's thinking. It's what his heart is into. So in Genesis chapter number one, when you have nothing but chaos, the Bible said the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. It's God and God alone that can bring life and life and creation out of chaos. He's the only one that can do it. And then when he moved upon the top of that mount there and he looked back and he looked back at what had been, what had been in the temple, what they had done. The Bible said there he hovered for just a moment. He stayed himself. He stayed for a little while, looked back. And my pop might have thought within himself, look what you've lost. I'm leaving with my glory. And then he went across the top of that mountain well, there in the book of Exodus, when the Holy Spirit came that night, the death angel came that night, and he went from house to house. The Bible said he would go over a house, and he would hover. He'd look down, look down. He could certainly see the people inside the house. He could see the people who were quivering in the corner, unsure whether the blood would protect them or not. They're the Christians who think they can lose their salvation. Then he could look into that house, and he could see the Christians in there who who were rejoicing and shouting, praising God, and knowing that within themselves there's no way you can stay saved. Somebody's got to do it for you. And they had assurance that the blood was going to take care of them. And when he saw the blood, he saw the lamb. And he saw the lamb and he saw the blood. He was satisfied. That's good enough. And he moved on to the next one. When he came to a house and there was no blood, there was no hope. And the death angel came in. Cecil B. DeMille does it like this. Cecil B. DeMille, who was a Jew who made the Ten Commandments, the movie The Ten Commandments, he, he literally had the Red Sea parting, did a good job on that. You know what he does with the death angel? How many remember? There's a mist. It comes underneath the door and comes in. And Cecil B. DeMille played the screams throughout Egypt that night. And then he went in that mist, came all the way into the house of Pharaoh and came right up to Pharaoh's throne. He was the most powerful man in all the world, but he couldn't stop the mist, and it took his firstborn. And Pharaoh stood there holding his son that had once been his son, and all he had now was a dead body. If Pharaoh had had blood over his doorpost, the death angel would have moved on. I'm so glad for the grace of God. Blood. Now I said all that to say this. The cross at Calvary is where the Holy Ghost hovered because the blood was shed. The blood atonement, the blood covenant, that's what the New Testament is. It's a blood covenant between God and man. And it's the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ. He hovered. But did you know what? That Bible says in Isaiah chapter number 53, he shall see the travail of his, what? Soul and shall be satisfied. What's that mean, preacher? It means this. It means that it takes the blood to wash your sins away but there's only one that knows how to apply it. Only one. He knows how, he knows when, he knows where to apply the blood. The Old Testament saint took hyssop, put it up. We don't take hyssop. I don't have the blood in my hands. I don't have the ability to apply it, put it anywhere. But he does. He does. And so when I begin to think about the Atonement. And I begin to think about what all went on at Calvary. I see two things. I see a physical sacrifice 
And I see a spiritual sacrifice. The soul is mentioned three times in Isaiah chapter number 53. Three times. All three times it relates to God the Father and God the Son. It has something to do with what Christ is doing for us on the cross. Now when he went to the tree, he went there as a prophet. What prophet hath Israel not killed? Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that stonest the prophets and killest them that are sent unto thee. How oft would I have gathered thee to me? The prophet, but when he rose from the dead, he was declared to be the son of God by the resurrection from the dead. That high priest came up from the dead. And that high priest ascended to the right hand of the Father. But when he comes back as the King of kings and Lord of lords, he comes back as king. Fulfilling all three offices that the only man in the Old Testament that ever dared do was David. He could be prophet. He could be priest. He could be king. So the Lord Jesus Christ comes back as prophet, priest, and king, all united together in one. Each one representing a specific period in his ministry to the saints of God. Right now it is because of the suffering that went on in his soul. The separation in his soul. The hurt and the pain in his soul. The sorrow he felt in his soul. The affliction that went on while he was on the cross. When it says in the book of Psalm 22 that the bulls of Basin have gathered themselves around me. That's a direct reference to demons as they had come to mock him and make fun of him. While he was hanging on the tree. All the force of hell was unleashed against the Son of God while he was hanging on the tree. Everything that Satan could throw at him. Satan played all of his trump cards. Everything he could do. He wanted to destroy him. Not physically. Spiritually. If he could ever get him to lose his integrity. Job didn't lose his, did he? No. So his soul endured it. His soul faced it. And the Bible said God made his soul an offering for sin. Think about that. That's what it says in Isaiah 53. He made his soul an offering for sin. There's not a condition a human being could ever engage in. There's nothing could ever happen to us. And Lord knows, man. You've got to live a while in this world to understand what I'm talking about. I see people right now going through horrendous circumstances. Yes. Horrendous, horrid circumstances. Suffering and broken homes. Children crying for parents. Debilitating diseases like Alzheimer's. And multiple sclerosis. Written, uh, confined to wheelchairs. Heart disease. Heart failure. Kidney failure. Lung cancer, all these things. The Apostle Paul, when God took him to the third heaven and showed him things up there that were unspeakable, unlawful for him to utter, he said this about all of that. He said this light affliction. If God hadn't taken Paul to the third heaven and let him see that, I would think, man, what an arrogant twit. What an what a, what a in-your-face condescending a uh, patronizing attitude. No, Paul understood it. Thrice beaten with rods, shipwrecked, night and a day in the deep. You can read what happened to him over there in Second Corinthians, all that he went through. He said, this is a light affliction, which is but for a moment. He said, it worketh in us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. We look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For well, the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. There's only one could see the soul of the Son of God. Only one. John stood there with Mary. John loved him. John didn't care if they took John and locked John up. John was standing right there while the rest of them had fled in fear of the Jews. John was right there. But he never saw his soul. Only one could see his soul. You see, friends? It is that soul of the Son of God who daily saves your life, who daily gets you through this journey. Your life with God is a journey. That's so important to understand. When I first got saved, I was under the impression that you got saved and got to a point and sailed on into glory. I really did. I thought that. I thought you reached this point in maturity and hallelujah to God and nothing matters anymore and you've gone. You're sure for heaven. Well, I was sure for heaven. 
But what I didn't realize was there's an awful lot of life to live before you get there. A lot of life to live. You know something? The Bible says that Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father, doesn't it? Let me believe that. Well, I believe that. But did you know that there's a statement in that Bible that gives you a little different slant on it? And I want to read it for you. And I want you to, I want you to take it home and think about it this afternoon. It's got a little different, little different uh, take on it. Here's what it says. John 14, 23, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him. Now listen carefully. And we will come unto him and make our abode with him. <laughs> What's that we? That's God the Father and God the Son by the power of the Holy Ghost. We will come unto him. Say, how can God be in heaven and be in you at the same time? Because he's God. That's good enough for me. That's all you got to say. He's God. He can be everywhere at the same time. He's God. They got a big word for it in theology. It's called omnipresence. But the bottom line is, he's God. His soul was made an offering for sin. I don't know what he's got for me. I don't know what the future holds for me. I know that my body wears out and my wife's body wears out. And I know at 68, I don't have, I got aches and pains I didn't know I had a few years ago. I got body parts I didn't know existed until <laughs> they started hurting. <laughs> some nights I sleep and some nights I don't sleep. I woke up at 2 o'clock this morning as I usually do and I said, Lord, I got to preach today. I got to teach. I need to get in that church. I got to have something to be able to get up there. Please let me sleep a little bit more. You know what? I went back to sleep. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah to God. A good night's sleep is something to be, it's worth, it's worth something, folks. Now, some of you hit the bed and you don't turn over until you get up the next morning. That's good for you, but it doesn't work that way with everybody. I get up sometimes at 2 or, two or 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning and I'll walk around like a zombie the rest of the day. Take a nap in the afternoon and that gets me through. But last night I slept, I'm as rested as I can, and I, I got it, here's what I did. I got up that morning, I think I got up at 7.30 this morning, I said, thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. Thank you for just let me have a night's sleep. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know what the future holds. I didn't like it a bit when my wife fell off the steps and broke her hip. Poor little thing laid there all day long and cried. All day and cried. And I laid there with her and tried to comfort her. Tried to help her. And both of us, like two stubborn mules, we should have called the emergency the ambulance a long time before. Like a couple of nutheads, we laid there in the floor all day long. And then finally that night when I said, now, listen, this ain't sprained. <laughs> you got a break or something's going on here. So we called the ambulance, and they came out, and they got her and took her to the hospital. And that night, you all remember, they did surgery that morning. I was, in, I was at UT Hospital while you all were having service, and they were doing surgery on her. And she, I didn't like that. I didn't like that. She fell off the steps. I didn't like that. I didn't like it a bit. A lot of things happen I don't like. You know, I don't go around and say, thank God for broken hips and thank God for heart failure. and thank, No, thank God for God being God in the middle of all of it. That's what I thank God for. Thank God for God being God. I don't want to give him up. He's worth it. I don't want to give him up. He's worth it. I don't want to give him up. Uh, this past two or three days ago, in northern Iraq, there's a group of people called Yazidis. You ever heard of them? There's about a million of them in the world. About a million. That's quite a few. I didn't know that. 60,000 of them live in Germany. They've been fleeing from that country because of persecution. These are Yazidis. They have a mixture of Old Testament, New Testament, and Zoroastrianism. Okay, now you just imagine what these people believe. They got all kinds of stuff. But this ISIS bunch of murderers came in there and told them that uh, they were going to convert or die. Some of those women said, well, then go ahead and kill us. We'll die. We'll die before we'll convert. And they don't know, apparently they don't know anything about the gospel. Boy, the judgment seat of Christ is not going to be a pretty thing, is it? Is your faith that real? Is it that real? Is it that real? Folks, this is real. There's a real Holy Ghost in here. 
We serve a real God. There's a real salvation. That's a real Bible. That's a blessed book. What would you take for that, that book right there? What's that book worth? If I didn't have that book, I wouldn't have anything but Darwin, Hegel, a bunch of junk like that. I got that book. Got that book. It's worth something. It's valuable. What's your faith worth? Is it real? Say, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Strengthen me in my faith. I want to get close to you. I can't do it on my own. I need the power of the Holy Ghost in my soul. God, pour your Holy Spirit out on me. Help me, Lord. I'm just a piece of flesh. You know that our frame, that we are but dust. That's what the Bible says. I need you, Lord. I need you. I need you. I need you. Why don't you come to him this morning and tell him that? You'll be amazed at how you'll realize his presence again in your journey. He won't leave you. He never has left you. He won't forsake you. He's always been there. It's just us that turns off the communication. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray you'd use what I've said for the glory of God. Help some soul in this house. May somebody leave out of here today, Heavenly Father, closer to thee than they were when they came. In Jesus' name, help us get our eyes off of each other. Lord, that'll destroy any of us. That's, 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 one of the, that's one of the most wicked tools of Satan. It just calls us to look at each other, pick each other, judge by each other. Help us get our eyes off of each other and put our eyes on Jesus. In thy sweet, holy, righteous, blessed name I pray, and for Jesus' sake I ask it.